Okay, so these chapters, the next two chapters, seven and eight, are dividing up the entire skeleton um, into the axial and appendicular. Um, we will do an awful lot of this in class, so there's not going to be a whole lot of additional concepts covered here, because like I said, we really test you over the names of these in the lab class and on a practical. But I will, you know, have a few questions on the lecture exam regarding, you know, describing a bone or describing something on a bone and asking you, you know, to name it. So, um, there, you know, it, it's always, like I said, it's good to see this, but it's even better to really practice handling the bones and thinking about which bones are which and, and why, right? So, uh, the, this is reiterates again what we were talking about in Chapter 6, you know, what, what's the job of bones, all right? And, of course, here is we're just looking at them structurally, we're not worrying about their calcium homeostasis and their ability to make red blood cells hematopoiesis. We're really looking at them as the fundamentally you are these support columns, you protect vital organs, and you allow movement because the muscle attaches to you and the muscle moves this rigid structure. Right? Um, part of the skeletal system of course is cartilage, right? So we have osseous tissue and then we have cartilaginous, right? which isn't going to be as, uh, as strong or supportive, but does trade off to give us some flexibility. And it's going to help cushion, we're going to find this where bones meet bones, and it's going to help you know, form these joints. We'll have ligaments and tendons, which are both basically the same kind of connective tissue. Generally, it's dense, regular connective tissue. Lots and lots of collagen, and collagen is rope-like, so it's very um, flexible but not stretchy. So, it, and it only allows, ligaments and tendons only allow movement in the direction of the fibers. So if you have a joint like the knee or the shoulder that does a lot of different types of movements, you're going to see a lot of different ligaments and tendons. The basic difference between the two is, again, a ligament is going to hold bones, right, attaches bones to bones, and tendons attach muscles to bones, right? And they both are able to, you know, limit uh, and protect the joint. That's what limit movement and protect the joint. Um, the bone, bones, we started looking at these in lab last night, so you're well aware that there's a lot of different sizes to them and shapes. And I add to this too, which you may not get as good a feel for this, but you know, think about this. They're also very high, a lot in their strength, how, how much they can support, right? And I said that, you know, bones constantly remodel throughout your life. They, you put a demand on them by using muscles, and they respond to that. So they are reforming and reshaping according to the activities you do. Because when the muscle contracts, it, it, there's, there's a strain, there's a pull, right? And that pull changes, creates a, a mild electrical current which um, activates the deposition of more bone by osteoblasts. Right? There are two divisions of the skeleton, as I mentioned to you guys too. There's axial and appendicular. And this chapter is going to focus more on the axial. But this is an overview, right? So kind of color-coded here, um, which is nice to come back to so that you, you're, you're aware of this and you know which bones belong to which ones. Because we do ask like one question on that on the lab practical and there'll probably be one on the lecture exam. Um, numbers are not so important. You know, I often tell students, look, you don't have to worry too much about numbers. I'll tell you when I need you to know a number. All right? But there are more bones in the appendicular than the axial. It is the center area consisting of the head, neck, um, back, and, and chest. And this is a pretty, you know, some very broad areas uh, here that allow a lot of attachment of muscle, especially on the rib cage and on the surface of the cranium. The appendicular is uh, really mostly long bones and, and, just, and short bones in the tarsals and, and carpals. Um, and these are really made to withstand, to allow support, right? And muscles attach there as well, but these are really support structures. And I said, you're really going to name all of these. So it seems like a lot. Take it in small bits. With the exception, you're not going to name all eight carpals or all seven tarsals. All right? So starting at the top, that's a good place to start, right? 
um, your skull or cranium in its entirety is uh, 22 bones. Now this does not include um, these very small ossicles that we're going to look at later on inside the ear. There's three in each ear. So we group them according to, you know, kind of a functionally. Your facial bones, of course, give you the shape to your face, right? Because that's what bones do as well. They create your overall shape of your body. And, uh, and then we have the, the brain case, or cranial vault, which is going to enclose the brain, all right? So we want to look at those. There's, you know, divided into 8 and 14 for this 22, okay? Now, note, only one bone in the skull is actually movable. So there's only going to be one synovial joint when we get to joints, and that is the mandible, as it articulates here with the temporal bone. Okay? Um, you have to look at the skull from several views, and these are two dimensions, so it doesn't give us the, the idea of, you know, in, in lab, again, please handle these as much as possible. I know the brain, the, excuse me, the skulls are not color-coded for the most part, but the joints are, are the sutures of the joints are, are really well, are very, very vis visible, and you can really see the different bones. So um, we do actually study it in its entirety, so I'm never going to lay out just a parietal bone and ask you what's this bone. You're going to see it in the context of the skull in a practical. All right? Lots and lots of openings and spaces here. Some very large ones here for the orbits and nasal cavity, and then some really small ones here like that infraorbital, right? So inferior to the orbital foramen. Because remember I said foramen. Here's another foramen. Those are another foramen. Those are holes. So I say it features the supraorbital margin, all right? So this, again, this gives you that kind of creates the edging to your eye, if you will, in your eyebrow. Um, a supraorbital, right, so above it, foramen, a little hole for nerves and vessels. An infraorbital foramen, all right. A nasal septum, so right down the middle, dividing the, the, the nares into two sides. And that's created by mostly the ethmoid bone, but then there's this tiny plate-like bone called the vomer bone that also contributes to that. There are three nasal conchi. You can see two of them here. The third one is the superior one, and it's up higher. Um, the superior and medial conchi are actually part of the ethmoid bone. Um, the inferior one here, right, that last one, the lowest one you see there, is actually its own bone, okay? And then there's a mental foramen, because remember the chin is that mental region, all right? If we look from the side, we see a few other things, all right? So from the side, we see the brain case and the upper and lower jaws separated, again, by this arch, okay? So the zygomatic arch here. Is, come, is made up of a zygomatic bone and the temporal bone, okay? So temporal bone is all here in purple. So that's the arch. And that's really your, your cheek, what you think of as your, your cheek, your lateral cheeks, okay? And you can feel that easily. That's what I said. So that's what's fun about bones. You can actually tell. Um, as we look from the side, we can see the mastoid process, which is just posterior to your ear and certainly to that meatus we're going to look at for sound to travel through. Um, the external acoustic meatus, so this tunnel for sound. There's a squamous suture, right? So squamous is scale-like. So this separates the temporal from the parietal, all right? A coronal suture, suture. <clears throat> so coronal is interchangeable with frontal. So the coronal suture, suture is really on a frontal plane, all right? The coronoid process, which means crown-like, and that's right here. It kind of does when you look at it like that. that arches of a crown, if you will. And then a mandibular condyle. So condyles are round, right? Remember processes are attachment sites, I said, that kind of jut out from muscles. Sutures are going to be joints, meatus is tunnels, right? There's another process, so here we're going to have another muscle attached. The condyle is an articulation, and it's kind of nice and rounded here, and that's again where the mandible articulates with the temporal bone, all right? So here, as we, we're just, we're going to, you know, that's your overview of the entirety. So we're now, now we're just going to look at the brain case here and think about the brain case. So frontal bone, and you know, everything's color-coded here, right? Provides our forehead, right? The roof of our nasal cavity and orbits, right? Orbits these things. There's a sinus in here, so we want to pay attention to that. There's a frontal sinus. There's an opening within the bone, and this opens to the nasal cavity. 
I've already mentioned the supraorbital foramen and the infraorbital foramen, so above and below holes for nerves and vessels. And of course the coronal suture, I said, that separates the frontal from the parietal, and it runs along a, a coronal plane. All right, looking from the side or lateral view, uh, sagittal view, um, parietal and temporal bones, and again, this is part of the brain case, which we have eight, these in total. So these two are paired. So we had one frontal, two parietals, and two temporals. So that, that gives us five bones, right? So the parietal bones are really the roof of the cranium. They have a sagittal suture that you're going to see that separates the two of them from each other. And, of course, the coronal suture that we've already covered that separates them from the frontal bone. Not highly remarkable otherwise. The temporal bone has a number of things going for it. And right here's that temporal bone here. So it really is, right, your ear would sit right here. If you think about this, there's a squamous suture or squamous suture that separates it from the parietal bone and even the occipital and uh, sphenoid. There's this remarkable external acoustic meatus, this long tunnel. There's a mandibular fossa, right? And I've seen people call that the temporal fossa too, but there's a, there's a mandibular fossa, so that's where the mandibular condyle articulates. So this is a small depression, all right? There's the mastoid process is actually in the temporal bone. There's a styloid process just anterior to it, and stylus means pen-like, and you'll pick that up pretty quick when you look at the real skulls. The zygomatic process we talked about that helps to create this, this side that you think of as your cheek. And then there's a carotid canal that allows, um, and we can't see it from this view, allows um, blood vessels through. All right. Um, the occipital, there's only one occipital. This is a posterior view, all right? It's not terribly remarkable. Um, it has, of course, the foramen magnum. If we turn this over, we'd see that large hole for the spinal cord. It has occipital condyles, so on either side of that foramen magnum are these rounded structures where the first uh, vertebra, C1, cervical 1, articulates. And that first vertebra is called an atlas, so that's kind of cool, too. We'll look at that has a lamboid suture because lambda is the upside down Y, right? And that's, it forms this, right there's this. That's a Y, all right? So lamboidal suture separates it from the parietals. Has an external occipital protuberance. And protuberance, again, it's, it kind of sticks out a little bit there in the back that you can generally see. There also are these neutral lines where, where muscles, so the protuberance and the neutral lines, these are area or knuckle lines, sometimes they call them that. <laughs> They are where um, muscles attach, all right? The sphenoid bone, only one of these, and then all we have left is the ethmoid for the actual cranium. Mm -hmm. So we remove the top of the skull to get a picture of this. The sphenoid is here in this um, kind of purple-red color, all right? And it's what it has that we're going to want to know is this cella torsica. And that translates to a little Turkish saddle. So I always look at it and I'm thinking, oh, a little person could just ride right in there. This is a little area, actually, where the pituitary gland um, resides. Uh, the sphenoid has sinuses in it. So now we have frontal bone with sinuses, and the sphenoidal bone has sinuses. Otherwise, this is a pretty cool bone, as I show it here by itself. Um, it looks like a huge butterfly. And in fact, you know, they, they talk about the wings it's pretty cool, right? But um, it has a number of foramen, but we're not going to ask you guys to know those. All right? The ethmoid bone, all right, the last part of the cranium, is uh, creates a nasal septum. Here's what it looks like on its own. Okay, it's, it's a pretty cool-looking bone, really, like the sphenoid. It does have sinuses. So now we have frontal, we have sphenoidal, and we have ethmoidal sinuses that open to the nasal cavity. It has a structure called the cristagalli, which means the coxcomb. So if you've ever seen a rooster's right <laughs> crown, if you will, um, that's what we're talking about, it looks like. This is an area where um, the membranes, meninges of the brain, actually attach in, in, in the anterior. And then, as we've mentioned before, it has the superior and medial conchi, right, which are these, again, these nice ridges that stick out into the nasal cavity or space, right? So on the next video, we'll go ahead and talk about the facial bones.